All right, so quick intro. So my name is Urkan. Uh, I'm the founder of Jupiter One and the CISO of Lifeomic. Uh, so I, I actually did a similar talk uh, last year at B-Sides Salt Lake City in 2019 that talks about how we internally build our security operations on a graph database, a graph-based CMDB. Uh, this is an extension to that. And, uh, you know, actually Jupyter One is the product that we built um, that supports that. But uh, I'm going to talk about this in more general kind of concepts of the graph CMDB and, and using some of the examples of our own product to, to highlight that. Um, and just, just so you know, I'll be sharing some code examples. Um, and this is doable uh, yourself with, um, with any graph database like Neo4j and other things as well. So um, a little bit of the a recap from uh, last year. So for folks who has not seen my talk last year, here's, here's a link to it. And I'll go through a couple of the recaps so people have some um, kind of shared, shared background and common background. So um, it's not kind of so abrupt when I jump into the use case. Uh, I'll, I'll go through this very quickly, and there's links at here and at the end. Uh, you, you can kind of get more details about this graph DB itself. Now, first of all, the reason that we build a graph-based CMDB or uh, a operating model built on a, on a graph is because of this, and because we want to analyze not just the resources and their configurations as a tr traditional CMDB or a configuration management database would do. But what we like to do is to, to be able to analyze the relationships and the context uh, that are derived in, uh, from these relationships. Uh, because as this statement says, defenders think in lists and attackers think in graphs, and that's why attackers win. And we don't want them to win. Right? We want to win instead. So uh, a few things that we can do with the, with the graph. And first of all, this is the data that we collect into a graph data model or a graph database. And it's not just the typical uh, IT assets that people think about. And we actually have the graph um, objects represents anything that we can think of that's related to our security operations, to our compliance programs, and, um, and just overall our digital operations. We are very much cloud native and digital. So this is relatively straightforward for us to do. There's a lot of APIs that we can leverage to build this. And anything that's not you know, API driven, we can still uh, manually using a script to create these in the graph database. So like, like you see here, it covers anything on this list from policies to risks to organization users, accounts, even vendors, and vulnerability findings. Uh, endpoint resources, network resources, agents on those hosts and servers, and of course, as well as our resources in the cloud in the AWS infrastructure. So what can you do with this graph, right? So once you have this graph, there's so much that you can do that we find that we end up doing with this graph. Now this becomes our uh, core and our almost our operating system for uh, for our security analysis and the compliance program. So here are some use cases. Uh, I'm going to focus on, on one in, in my uh, example in a little bit that has to do with access review. Um, but these are some of the use cases that can be realized with this data in the graph. And the, the pattern, it really is uh, pretty straightforward. And we have one single pattern, which is you know doing security as code and in an engineering pattern where we can use APIs to collect data and then use query to analyze and uh, get insight from that data for any of these use cases. Now, let me describe a little bit more what this graph looks like. So uh, a graph for this particular use case for GRC, you know, policies, controls, and just overall program management may look like this. So you got an organization that has policies, uh, which they have procedures and, and controls that implements policies. And then you have various compliance standards that you have to meet, and the there's, each standard has a requirement, and the procedures and the controls implement those requirements, and so on and so forth. Right, so this is a high-level view of the, what the graph data model looks like for, uh, for this area of things. And then you can see the, the gray boxes where, uh, from here, it connects to other subgraphs. And there's a graph for user management, account management, and vendor management. 
and here are some of the interrelationships of how the organization owns the account and which account has what service and has what user or user groups and so on and so forth. Now this ties into the previous GRC data model and it also ties into the vulnerability management uh, data model, uh, which is presented here. Uh, that everything in here surrounds with the vulnerability findings, which can impact a variety of different resources, like a host or application or code repo. Um, and this graph like um, here, uh, for example, right, allows us to answer questions like, uh, what's the pattern in these findings, right? So which uh, which weakness is probably the most predominant in our environment? Uh, in, in other words, right, so if we have 100 findings that that's all exploiting us the same weakness, so we know that is a weak point in our ecosystem. So that's what this graph represents. And then we have a graph that represents network and endpoint infrastructure of different hosts and resources and um, in different entities in I in the uh, AWS uh, infrastructure and and so on and so forth. Now I'm going to use a, a specific example and you see you know what questions can the graph answer. Uh, here, here's some example questions specific to AWS, and I'm going to um, ask this particular somewhat complex questions and how we answer this with the graph query. And the, the question here is, are there internet facing EC2 instances that are allowed access to non-public S3 buckets? Now, uh, it, it's a long question. And, uh, and in order to answer this question, it actually has seven different criteria um, that it has to meet. And these are the seven things that we have to check for in order to answer precisely without noise or without false positives, the answer to this question. So first, instances are active, they are live. There are security groups in, in those instances allowing you know, to or from the internet. And instances are publicly routable. Um, and then there's uh, network and you know, VPC access allowing the, uh, the network access to the internet and uh, security group rules and IAM policies and IAM roles and so on and so forth. But you can read this in the slide. So, all of these conditions has to meet uh, in order for for this particular um, for this particular uh, question to be answered, right? So this is what this looks like with a graph query. So imagine that if you are to try to answer this across oops, multiple environments uh, at the same time, if you have maybe fifty or even a hundred or more AWS accounts and uh, you have thousands of instances and you know hundreds and thousands of IAM policies and rows and the equal amount of uh, S3 buckets. So this, this becomes a classic security problem where you're trying to find the needle in the haystack. Now with a graph, right, so assuming that we have this data collected and we have mapped out these relationships and how things are related to each other, so we can run a query like this, right? Basically, traverse the graph and starting from the internet and you know looking for um, connections to security groups and then looking for connections to um, I, uh, a AWS EC2 instances and here's a cluster of them and then uh, looking at the IAM rows assigned to these instances and then the policies assigned to these rows and their access to the S3 buckets and if they are um, labeled or classified as public or not. So this particular example, right, so showcases, you know, how you can use a graph query to do a um, graph traversal and do this type of th threat and risk analysis or configuration auditing or whatever you call it. So this is a, a bit of a recap of, um, you know, why we built the uh, graph CMDB and you know, how we're using it internally to identify risks. Now, uh, I'm gonna move on to a particular uh, use case uh, that we've just recently did for, uh, for our user access review. So the question is, is really this, uh, is you know, how do we get cross environment context uh, out of the graph, right? So it's not just within the AWS environment itself, right? How do we connect the, the dots across multiple environments? So from you know one user from user accounts from one environment to another one. So let me describe this use cases um, for you a little bit. And a a recent article from Microsoft that um, 
uh, that you saw here below actually was from their RSA presentation uh, just a, a month or so ago. And they've um, put out this report that says 99.9% .9 of the compromised accounts did not use MFA. And only 11% of all of the enterprise accounts that they have visibility to uh, actually have an MFA solution uh, overall. So for us internally, it's the natural question is, uh, are MFA enabled for all of our user accounts, right? Now with a graph, uh, this can be answered pretty easily. Well, so first we thought that uh, we have all the users, right? So we collected all the user information from the different accounts. You know, we have accounts um, in Bitbucket and GitHub and Octet and so on and so forth, right? We have all of those aggregated into the graph so we can easily run a query and something like this that says, you know, find user with MFA enabled not equals to true uh, that has not been assigned or is not using or does not have an MFA device. So this query actually have two conditions. You know, one of them is saying that uh, uh, if the user itself doesn't have the MFA enabled flag as we've analyzed the configuration from a provider. And additionally, uh, if that's the case, uh, and, and also the user does not have a separate MFA device that we know of attached to the user account that's you know, configured this way. So this checks for, for both of those conditions. Well, the result of that query when we first ran it um, says you know, 569 user accounts with no, uh, no MFA enabled. Well, that can be right. We have uh, actually, we're a small organization. We have less than uh, 100 employees and you know across multiple environments you know maybe we have uh, a thousand or so user accounts right uh, assuming that each person have 10 accounts and that's roughly a thousand accounts so more than half of those had no M no mfa enabled and that that just that can be right because i know that we we that's not a case for us so what what was happening uh, why were there so many false positives exactly because of single sign off so these users, they never log in directly to the provider. Instead, they log in via, uh, we use Okta, right? so via single sign-on. So as you can see here, that uh, these provider user accounts, right? as we call the provider APIs to get information about those users, uh, and the provider is going to say, yep, they don't have MFA en enabled. So if we ask GitHub and you know, give me the list of users, uh, or as Jira or Google or Office 365 or no before, and these, these environments, they're all gonna return and say, yep, here's the list of your, your users and they don't have MFA enabled. Now in reality, they actually do go through MFA because the login flow uh, is via Okta, uh, single sign-on using SAML. So here, here's an example. In this example, I, I run a query uh, just for my own user. And uh, if you look at the query itself, I said, you know, give me the Bitbucket user with, uh, with my name uh, as user A. And that has an account, which is this Bitbucket account uh, that connects an Octa application, which is this Atlassian Jira application. And that is assigned an Octa user, which is my Octa user right here. And show me if my Octa user has uh, assigned or is using an MFA device. Well, it turns out I have four MFA device configured. So what this query is showing you is that uh, I am actually logging in through Okta and into Bitbucket. And I am you know, using MFA for my Octet account, but um, Bitbucket doesn't know that, right? So, and uh, the Bitbucket user doesn't have that property for MFA. So what we, end up doing is, well, we, know, we have this information in the graph. You know, we just want to enrich this Bitbucket user entity uh, to have that property, to have to know that I am an, a single sign-on user and I have MFA enabled if this graph condition is met. So here's, here's what we did. Um, but we also don't want to assume, right? So we don't want to assume that's always true. So we only want to do this uh, type of um, connection, or we only want to update my Bitbucket user entity only if this condition is met. So we, we don't want to make the assumption that because we're using uh, Okta, that all of our users are going through this flow. So what we have to do for uh, accuracy and a level of assurance 
is to do some correlation using the graph. So for each user, we have to run that query essentially is to say, I have to correlate for each user that is not an Okta user, um, then application is assigned in Okta and the user uh, has a matching, have a matching user by email or whatever case that might be uh, that is assigned to this Okta application, the single sign-on application. And then my, my Okta user has the MFA uh, device configured or assigned. So that's the condition. Now, how do, how do we do this? We can do this with Corey and with code. So the first, for the first condition, um, so this is the query we, we ran, right? You say, you know, find a user with uh, the unique identifier, the unique key as the first user. Uh, that has this account that connects to whatever account that might be, or it could be an, a, a Jira account, it could be a GitHub account, uh, or a no before account, whatever case that might be. So these are generic um, representations of user and account. Now we say we want to find that, con that account that specifically connects to a corresponding uh, Octet application. And I want to find the users that are assigned to uh, the Octet application, then the user must be active. And then I'm going to compare th this first user and the second user. And if their username or email or some other condition is met, then I can know with some level of assurance that this first user right here is actually a single sign-on user. So if that is met, then we set the single sign-on user, SSO user flag on, the, on user A to true. Uh, and then secondly, you know, as you can see here, right, so we added a condition and say, for that same user, um, if that is a single sign-on user, uh, I'm going to run a second query and to look for any of the MFA device that's assigned to that uh, Okta user. If this is found, then we're going to set a MFA enabled flag to true on that original user. So what this should allow us to do is to filter out all the noise. And uh, it turned out that actually worked. So after we ran that uh, script, so this is the same example for my user. So my Bitbucket user now has a MFA enabled flag and a single sign-on user flag, uh, both set to true. And that's what we use graph context, right? So this is just one uh, example use case of how we use the graph context and use code and use query uh, to enable and reduce the noise in our uh, security operations and in our threat analysis, and in this case for access reviews. Uh, and when we run this query again, this is the exact same query that we, uh, we run again, we identified instead of 569, so now we actually have 47 user accounts with no MFA. And we've went through these, the results of those 47, and that is actually correct. And uh, remember previously we said we don't want to make any assumptions. Right, so, and uh, this actually caught a bunch of system accounts, uh, that these system accounts were not SSO users and they should not have MFA enabled flag um, set to true, as intended, and then they don't. And we also, in the process, actually identified a handful of user accounts that actually need remediation. So that's the, uh, the end result. Um, and I wanna share with you some of the resources. So this, the code that we did for this particular exercise is available in our um, graph enrichment example repo. Uh, we also have, I, I've done a, a number of different SecOps automation examples uh, that's in a different repo that you can check it out. Uh, and of course, you know, check out some of, some of my other talks at, uh, this is the last year's talk at uh, B-Sides. Uh, and then there's a talk that goes a little bit more deeper into the vulnerability management use case of using a graph database at RSA. Uh, this, act, this talk right here was actually uh, joined by the CISO of Reddit. So this might be interesting for some of you. So I went through this very quickly. I wanna leave you with this, right? Is that um, the, the reason we built everything into the graph database is because well, we are consolidating our data into a knowledge base. And this knowledge base allow us to be able to query things and be able to take action with confidence faster using code and using query and using automation built from that. Uh, I, I think I went through everything very quickly and uh, I wanna give it a few minutes to kind of go through any Q&A if there is any. <laughs> 
All right. How do we do Q and A here? Um, they can post it in Q and A, and it'll pop up in the bottom of your controls as Q and A questions. Okay. All right. I don't see I don't, any. I don't see any in there right now. All right then. Well, thank you very much. And that's the end of my presentation.